Thank you. Uh, all right, we're being recorded. And this is the uh, hard to believe October gathering of the round table. So this is now what our seventh uh, month that we've done this, I think. So thank you all, those of you who are, um, who are returning and I see some familiar faces, but I also see some new faces here. Um, so a couple of things today that we want to, uh, to address right off the top. Uh, and that is that we are um, going to be talking about, we want your input in this, uh, about um, an idea that, that Carrie uh, Kennedy has, uh, we're going to be talking more about, but to do some, uh, either a standalone session or to start doing some breakouts specifically related to wine. Um, 90% of uh, the attendees on this are uh, spirit space, but we've got a few who bring some incredible insights from wine. So we're going to be um, working on uh, a series uh, of of calling them wine up uh, uh, elements of Drinks Professionals Network. And uh, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that. And Carrie is here. And uh, she and Stephanie and I are going to be meeting on Monday to hatch more of a, a plan related to that on Indigenous Peoples Day. We're gathering in celebration. <laughs> um, and I also want to, so I want to um, also mention that at the end of this, because we do have um, so many familiar faces, uh, which is an excellent sign because we said from the beginning, you only get out of this what you put into it. Uh, and the fact that uh, um, there's such a great um, roster of experienced uh, uh, perspectives that come to this regularly. At the end of this, we'd like to um, take a few moments and have those of you who are regulars to share in a very brief soundbite type of way, um, what keeps you coming back. So we wanna, we wanna be thinking about that uh, as, as just so we can continue to grow uh, the percentage of new people who join, as well as maintain the roster of regulars. Um, so with that, I am going to um, lead off what we generally do, those of you who are here, we, we give everybody, um, you know, their, their 30 to 60 seconds uh, to give a little self-intro and tell the latest of what's going on. But I specifically want to start with some of the new people uh, who are here. And I'm going to kick it first to um, Mike Bacco, um, who has joined us uh, from California. Um, and uh, uh, Mike, want to say hello and, and tell us a little bit about uh, what uh, what's new in your world. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, and thanks so much for including me in the group. Um, this is really interesting, and uh, I'm, I'm looking at all the people and, and the companies, and what a great opportunity to, to uh, learn about a lot of different aspects of the business. I've been in the spirits business for over 40 years. I was with the Seagram Company for 20 and then hung out my own shingle for the last 20. i um, not gonna bore you with the details in between, but I'm currently um, involved in the uh, restructuring and repositioning and, and relaunch of a tequila company that was basically a mom and pop business um, for 20 years. And it's an incredible product, um, uh, a true craft tequila, which doesn't really exist in the space anymore. Uh, most tequilas now are adulterated and commercialized. And uh, so that's kind of what I'm knee deep in right now. Um, just broadly, I can speak a lot to the tequila category. If, if you're interested, I'll give you a few seconds on that. Um, very interesting, growing, probably the fastest growing category in the industry right now. Uh, last year, 2020, um, gallonage volumetrics grew at about 16%. Uh, year over year, um, uh, which is unusual. The tequila category was growing at about six to seven percent a year for the last 20 years. You could set your watch by that, but it really took off last year. Um, and the the, the category is hampered because of a huge shortage of agave in Mexico um, because the planting was reduced about six or seven years ago when there was a glut of, of agave. So people didn't plant. And so now it takes about six or seven years to grow an agave plant and, and people just don't have agave to the point where um, uh, there's a lot of brands and huge commercial brands, Don Julio, Patron, where they're only shipping 25% of ordered product in a lot of markets. Um, literally in a lot of the control states, shelves are empty, there's no tequila, which has benefited us because we have 500,000 Agave is under cultivation. We grow our own plants, and and you know we're vertical, and and we're doing great. So uh, it's an interesting category. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, growing. It's becoming more sophisticated. 
people are very aware now of all the adulteration of tequila products out there with the addition of flavorings, sugars, um, and, and so forth, and, and, and emulsifier chemicals. And so we have an advantage because we have a pure product. But that's kind of what's going on in my world. We're, we're, we signed a national uh, distribution and brokerage agreement with Southern. We're in every market in the United States now, and we're just ramping that up. So that's, well, that's great. And I think uh, you've already had a, an opportunity to see some of the value of this. Did you connect yeah. with Jason, who's here? Yeah, we, we, uh, we're going to be uh, getting together later today, I think. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I want to I want to now just jump over to uh, Michael Lane, uh, who's joining us uh, for the first time. And Michael, if you could unmute, there you go. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your your business, and um, what you're seeing. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, pretty new to the business. Uh, came in buying supplies from uh, other producers, and we're considering actually getting our own distillery going here in about 18 months focus on the the bourbon side of the business and that piece you know for you know the long term and uh, we're also doing what I call a build-out model of a franchise uh, Sleepy Fox distillery uh, sort of barbecue restaurant approach where we might replicate that maybe to 10 locations here in Virginia so we're kind of a combo very new company like I say only about uh, four years but uh, where we have a retail establishment pushing our own liquors from moonshines, you know, through the bourbons. Uh, we don't currently make gin or rum. And uh, so right now, I guess we have aged out maybe 3,000, 3,500 gallons of bourbon. And down the road, we like to get up to where maybe we're doing 500 barrels a year. That would be once we would uh, have the new distillery operation. Well, you've got a lot of um, experience on this call uh, that uh, of people that I hope uh, you you leverage because you can get a lot of insights either those who have been there done that or who can help to uh, uh, to support your your growth in, in a number of ways. So, welcome. I'm glad you're here for the first time, and you'll get to meet more of those. Um, I want to uh, jump to Attila, who is coming, I think, from Phoenix Packaging. Uh, I see. I don't see a video. Uh, I I assume you're there. <laughs> Hello? If not, no, we'll carry on. Yeah, I'm here. There you are. Can you hear oh, me? Yes. We hey, do. sorry, guys. I'm just on the road, so I have to pull over to the side to uh, kind of do this. Um, uh, my name's Attila Joe, work up, at, uh, up in Montreal, across the border, up in Canada. I've uh, been in the business for uh, 34 years, supplying packaging to all sorts of different mediums. Um, when I joined Phoenix back in the beginning of 2000, um, I got introduced to the wonderful world of spirits and alcohol and beverages, and I haven't looked back since. Um, it's been a wonderful experience working a lot with some craft distillers, um, really now focusing on some of the more environmental concerns that I would say the community as a whole um, has and how we can help the individual um, distiller, uh, bottle producer, not producer, but I would say uh, user, so that we can um, have a more sustainable approach to everything. In the past, many people have said, hey, the thicker the base, the better. Well, why? Um, Europe um, is, is a model that I've been utilizing in my thinking process because they have already gone through the eco-friendly approach to trying to reduce the, the carbon footprint and environmental footprint on these bottles. And I'm using a lot of that up in Canada. They're a little bit more open to that because we're more um, um, influenced by the European markets, whereas in the States, it, it's generally a much more... Um, I'm in my own world approach and it's fun to be able to bring those two avenues together and work with customers to apply their designs, their desires, and try to come up with something that's going to be equally as nice, yet more environmentally friendly. That's been the big push so far. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody wants to talk to me about glass supply, that's a whole other conversation that I well, will have that's what I was, with anybody. I was gonna... I was going to ask you, forgive us the latest on when the glass supply chain is going to be 
back in action? Um, all of the major suppliers in North America are booked through probably Q2 of 2023. Um, there are some of them that are actually vetting out some of the le less profitable companies because they're oversold. And I'm talking the majors here, the top five or six world glass producers. Um, many people have shifted from China glass because of either political issues, quality issues, or just plain freight issues at this point in time. Um, the European glass supply is also drying out very, very quickly. There is some expansion predicted, but nowhere near enough to be able to handle the growing market of glass supply, uh, glass demand in North America. Um, we're encouraging all of our customers to plan nine to 12 months out. Um, the days of saying, hey, um, I wanna go to XYZ company because I, it's like a Walmart, those are gone. There are no stock on the shelves. Um, sadly enough, I'm at a point where I'm actually calling up some customers who may have extra glass and say, hey, listen, I got people in trouble. It's almost like the barter system where I'm buying from Peter to pay Paul because, you know, there's no glass out there. Um, the alleviation is probably going to come in the third, the second to third quarter of 2023 when things will get a little bit easier. We're encouraging everybody to forecast out as much as possible. Um, look, to be brutally honest, the glass and the glass in China is not bad quality, but the freight costs are astronomical. You're looking at over a dollar a bottle just for freight. And that put into anybody's budget model throws them completely out of whack. So it is a difficult, it is a difficult situation right now. Um, we did have one glass company that was producing here in North America. They decided that at the end of the year, they're going to, they're going to bulldoze their facility and bring everything from overseas. So uh, it's like supp a demand a supply has been taken away and the demand's continuing to grow. So there, it, it is an incredibly hard position to be in. Is, is was, that company Paramount just out of curiosity? Yes. Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. Thanks. No, that, no problem. I, 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 pardon me. I was asking Stephen if that's one of his suppliers. Yeah, we're, we're currently, we're currently using Saber and Paramel and I, and I have, a little teeny bit with Vetro as well, but predominantly Saber and Paramel. And we're seeing all kinds of problems. Paramel is scaring the hell out of us right now. So that's mm -hmm. why I asked. Well, uh, you, know, the, you mentioned uh, Attila about um, looking for you know, people to trade trade glass. Uh, did, did you, have you had any, um, any traction on that? That seems like it may be- uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I had a client out in, um, in Utah that had 30,000 pieces of spare glass. So I said, listen, put them aside, give me your price. And I satisfied two people who are in dire straits. Um, but it's ridiculous. I've been doing this for six or seven months already where I'm reaching out to my customers and saying, listen, if you have anything lingering around that you don't need, let me know. There's going to be someone out there that wants to buy it. Paramel, I mean, when Steve, Stephen mentioned Paramel, and Stephen, pleasure to make your acquaintance. We, we're already working together on a few projects. Um, Paramel's turned around, and um, um, they have hundreds of containers they can't even ship from where they're currently located. Where are they located? They're going to be, uh, Paramel has a factory. In Sri Lanka, they have a mega factory in India and maybe even a smaller factory. Their primary business started out as pharmaceutical and nutraceutical. Um, mm. They bought a company called Wheaton Glass years ago, for those of you who are old enough to remember Wheaton Glass. Um, and, and, and it's been a very much of a strain. Um, they have a tendency of doing this where They'll buy a factory. They did this in England. They bought a factory. They shut down the factory, repatriated everything to India. Under regular circumstances, we should be okay. But under current circumstances, it's terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, Do you know, you know if there's any chance they're going, they're going to delay that closure because of the current constraints? I mean, it makes as no far sense. As, 
as f- I, I understand logistically, it makes no sense, but from speaking to people who have gone to audit that facility, it is an incredibly inefficient facility. And that's why a lot of people haven't, haven't, haven't expressed the desire to buy it. And, and um, as far as I know, they're not shutting it down. My rep has told me my lead times for glass is 24 to 28 weeks. And that's just for production. Well, uh, anyone else have any um, glass woes while we're on that topic before we go to? No, but I mean, I don't think it's isolated to what, what he's saying. I mean, my company is based out of Italy and we're just not having glass problems. We're having cork problems. We're having a whole dry goods problem. We're having container problems. I mean, just probably every problem you could imagine, we're going through it. I mean, we yeah. had holiday gift packaging that's probably not going to make it for the holidays. There's just problem after problem after problem. Then things are getting here. I mean, I'm sure you just see the news. It's not just wine and spirits related. It's food. I mean, you got ships that are just sitting there. You don't have people to unload them. Then they get unloaded. You don't have truck drivers. I mean, I, I just think we're just in, in a big mess. Yeah, I don't know if most of you know my background, but I, I spent a big hunk of my professional life doing international trade and logistics. Um, I ran Ford Motor Company supply chain in Asia for several years. Uh, I ran Tyco Plastics and Adhesives uh, uh, global supply chain. Um, everybody I'm talking to from my old industry is it's it's a global issue right now. I mean, sea container availability, ocean lift availability, domestic truck availability. This is not just glass. It's not just us. It is a fundamental change. Uh, in the last 24 months in the global logistics world uh, because of of predominantly lack of drivers and lack of personnel. Somebody's got a weird something happening. Um, You know, I was up uh, in uh, the Northeast uh, a few weeks ago, uh, sitting on the beach, uh, and I was amazed at how many ships, cargo ships I saw, you know, a mile or two out, um, stacked up for days, um, barely moving, nothing was moving, just sitting there. And I guess that's being replicated over and over again in in, uh, all around the the world, uh, which is crazy. Um, You can't get stevedores. Stevedores are just, I mean, the unions are trying to hire and and can't do it. but back to glass for a minute, uh, Poland seems to be the uh, upcoming spot to get glass. I don't know if anybody's researched that uh, at this point, but um, that's a thought. And where's that coming from? <laughs> oh, okay, sorry, Sam. We, we were having uh, doorbells or something going on behind you. <laughs> Um, as I said, um, my research says that, uh, and, and from experience, um, knowing people in Poland, that Poland is now trying to pick up some of the, the, the glass shortage slack. I, you guys may want to do some research on that, but, uh, you know, we switched from Saver to China, uh, and we found the Chinese quality was great, uh, but we were shipping from China to New Zealand and so we didn't have the cost uh, issues that shipping from China to the United States, and this was prior to COVID. So things have apparently, you know, changed. Uh, and um, just just to recap for everybody, so Sam was the uh, uh, owner, executive chairman of Broken Shed um, Vodka uh, that he sold to private equity in 2019. <laughs> So that's what he's re- referring to New Zealand. Um, and I'm, I'm now gonna let you, Sam, pick up to what you were talking about because you're in Kentucky and you continue on this quest to look to uh, acquire a distillery. And um, it, you know, you, you shared some information regarding that uh, and regarding how challenging it is, but a lot of that was before this call. Um, so I just think that's an interesting um, perspective that you've got this moment in time where you know, whether it's because there has been so much consolidation from some of the big guys um, who have, have acquired or others who are um, 
uh, Kentucky based who are who are just um, holding out. Well, uh, th thank you, Michael. I, I I have very little to say about that other than um, there seems to be a capacity issue here that that is uh, causing people to uh, overvalue um, their um, their businesses. Um, I've made made a, a serious offer. Uh, for one distillery uh, that has no brand. I don't want to get into any more detail than that, but the offer was uh, 9.5 EBITDA. And I think that's all the money. Uh, if you factor in, uh, you know, their, their, their profitability versus your ability to finance, um, 9.5 is, is really all the money that that uh, a profitable distillery uh, will sell for. Uh, having said that, there are a lot of smaller craft distillers that are on the brink of uh, distinction. I mean, they're 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 going to disappear unless they come, unless they find someone who's going to come in and 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 rescue them and and. and pump some money into the into their businesses. Um, so it's a dichotomy here. Uh, a lot of um, overvalued uh, properties and a lot of properties that are in in serious trouble. And uh, you you leave Kentucky and you sort of find th the opposite. Uh, people are more willing to to sell and, and not uh, uh, you know, hang by their fingernails uh, until someone comes along and saves them. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. that makes sense to, to everyone, then uh, that's what I've found. And, and uh, I have been very lucky to have been involved with someone who's, who's uh, been extremely helpful in, in, in looking for, for properties uh, that uh, could make financial sense. Well, I think that's a valuable, valuable insight. And as a segue, I would like to uh, say hello to Ross Colbert, who's joined us. Um, uh, Ross, I assume you came here. I don't, we don't see any video, um, but- Yes, um, thank you. And Ross is managing director at KPMG Corporate, uh, and he specializes in uh, investing in the beverage sector. So I think there's a lot of people on this call who might uh, gain some <laughs> valuable insights. And hello, how are you? Welcome. Hi, thank you, Michael. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, I've got my we video. You and we see you. I've got my video on, but I'm riding shotgun on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and my wife is driving. So, um, hope, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to uh, at least hear me. Uh, Absolutely. I, now we hear and see you, and it's good to know that you're not driving. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, and thank you for the introduction. So yes, I lead KPMG corporate finance's coverage on global beverages uh, on the corporate finance side. So not audit, not tax, not accounting. I, I, I've spent my 25 plus year career on M&A growth capital valuation uh, across the beverage industry. So on beer, wine and spirits, but also soft drinks, water, coffee, tea, et cetera. And I love these opportunities to uh, meet with uh, industry executives, um, this network of, of spirit focused uh, executives, because this is really, uh, you know, an opportunity to connect with folks on the operating side of the business. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, you know, it gives me sort of a, an opportunity to kind of hear firsthand how company, what, what companies are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I can offer you in exchange for that is sort of give you a corporate finance perspective as you think about transactions, events, capital raising, um, all of those, um, you know, that's something that um, if it's helpful, you know, I'm happy to share my opinion on, you know, fr from a corporate finance investor standpoint, how investors view the industry um and there's i mean it, it, and it's all positive right i mean uh 
spirits is has had a, a renaissance like no other. Um, and for somebody like uh, all of us, it feels like I've been around the industry long enough to recognize how far the pendulum has swung in favor of spirits today versus where it was, you know, 10 or 15 years ago when when beer and wine seem to be uh, capturing more occasions. But, um, you know, I think I think spirits is in a is in a enviable position, uh, you know, and, and uh, the transformation of the three tier system in the U.S. has has a great deal to do with that, as we've all recognized coming out of the pandemic. So I'm going to be an active listener uh, and uh, love to get your feedback. If you feel free to ask me a question at any time, I'll try and do my best to answer you without, um, you know, getting getting up on the soapbox, uh, so to speak. Uh, but I'm, uh, well, Russ, I, I do Russ, know. Thank you. And I wanted to point out that there, I know there are several people on this call uh, who own distilleries who are in the midst of capital raises, uh, who I definitely know will appreciate the connection. And one of the things that this is designed to facilitate is, is to help make direct connections. So you, not only do you, you get to ask a question, but you know Stephanie um, will uh, make note of, of putting people together and, and sharing contacts. And everyone who's on this call will get an email following up with everybody else's contacts. So we want to make that uh, make that uh, remind everybody of that's part of the way this works. It's not just this session, but it's all the stuff that hopefully happens uh, after uh, the, each session and before the next uh, that, that brings value. So I don't know if um, uh, Stephen or Paula um, want to, uh, you know, make direct connects with Ross, but I'm imagining you do. <laughs> Absolutely, Ross. I'll I'll reach out via LinkedIn right now. And, and, and also uh, yesterday, I sent to Sam um, some information about your um, business. So uh, we haven't spoken about it yet, but I know, Sam, I assume you received it, the email that I sent you. Great. Yeah. Thank you. That, that, that's very kind of you for, for that uh, connection. So appreciate it, Michael. All right. And so Jason, I think we'll keep the financial connection going. You bring it. You bring, uh, so Jason um, Sleeman, uh, tell everybody what you do, which is relevant to uh, what we're talking about here. Yep, so I uh, finance uh, craft beverage companies. So um, mainly expansions right now, uh, but we still do startups and uh, anywhere uh, within the US is actually interesting because uh, I was at a craft brewers conference in Denver and I happened to take a side trip to go meet Stephen in person. So I got to go to Golden Moon and uh, try some of the stuff. And the only the only drawback I had was I didn't have uh, enough room in my carry on to take uh, some stuff with me. Well, we're <laughs> glad you visited. Come back and visit us again. Yeah, I'll, well, I'll do it. So um so yeah, so what I do is I, I finance, and, and this is a this has kind of been a weird year. I would say that 2021 has been even a year weirder weirder the year than 2020, uh, and the fact that um, 2020 people were scrambling for kind of traditional financing and saying, hey, look, let me go get all this traditional financing and try and get working capital and try and get some of these things. And this year, a lot of people have really kind of focused on the. Uh, you know, as PPP has kind of dried up, there's still uh, EIDL, the EIDL money, um, they raised that ceiling to 2 million. And so a lot of, although this is not the, um, you know, the, the purpose, some of those uh, borrowers out there have kind of turned to that as a funding mechanism versus traditional uh, borrowing. And so it's been kind of a unique year uh, just to kind of see see where things go. So I, I think we'll probably get to back to a more traditional funding year in 2022, where, um, you know, we may not have all these kind of um, additional funding options out there, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of get back to that traditional funding. But, you know, we're, we're, st we're still seeing a lot of uh, startup requests. We're seeing a lot of expansion requests. We're, we're seeing a lot of action, you know, kind of in all three phases, both the wine uh, the spirits and the beer, and we're seeing a you know kind of a resurgence of cider and you know some of these other things too. So it's it's kind of an interesting uh, time just because you know I think people are looking at it and saying if if I made it through to this point, I'm good, and so they're taking that as a green light to kind of go and you know expand or do other things. 
a question. I mean, it might be kind of silly. Um, what category do you, because I mean, we all say beer, wine, and spirits. What do you consider those seltzers? Because that's um, really taking over a lot of the beer consumption and the white wine consumption. I would tell you that most of the seltzers are produced at least on the craft side, right? So I'm not talking about all the mega package stuff are being produced by breweries. So most of them are coming up with a- You lump it into the beer, you lump it into the beer category. Yeah, I, I would lump it into the beer category as well because that's who's mainly putting it in their tap rooms, mainly doing that. I'm not seeing that on like the spirit side. There's not a lot of distilleries that are offering seltzers, but most of the breweries out there have a seltzer that they've made that they're offering as a consumable on-site product. Well, the majority of seltzers are malt liquor based for the purpose of, you know, being able to be uh, sold in convenience stores and grocery stores. So that's probably... Well, a lot of them are calling themselves vodka soda. I mean, there's, I just had a tequila, whatever, what is it called? Um, so there's, there's, there's like ranch water, right? So te tequila and soda. Yeah. Yeah. I think partly it's because where the ABV sits. Um, most of those are, you know, kind of in that under, you know, in that five, six percent abv and so I, that's mainly you know most of them i'm seeing are like seven yeah are you talking about rtds or are you talking about hard seltzers i mean i i sort of missed the point here i think if you're talking about the we're, i think we're talking about the seltzers the things that are you know on the macro level are the white claws and in, in that where at the craft it's still that same thing a bubbly low calorie alternative that they're, you know, a lot of them are using either real fruit or something like that. But malt seltzers primarily, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, the RTDs, and I think I'm, are a completely different category. I'm seeing a lot of the big guys getting into the hard seltzer and the malt seltzers. Uh, but a lot of them really aren't malt. A lot of them are, do, do contain vodka, using tequila, spirit. everything. I mean, right. I mean they're, they're all over the place now. Tweeted seltzers or so on. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a, a brewery here in um, in Georgia, um, Ironmonger, that I know that they well actually two of them here that have they have made inroads into uh, seltzers that do have spirits. And they, the reason I know is because they've been in touch with us to help find spirits and source and all that. Uh, and I know Jason, you know about one of them, uh, and and another one that, and Scofflaw is also doing that uh, as well, and, uh, and and building out. So there's there's an interesting. Um, uh, I think this is an interesting conversation to see when those worlds really do start to merge because we are having, you know, breweries um, getting DSP licenses and, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, moving in that direction. So there's more of a, of a combo brewery distillery uh, uh, type of business happening. I'm seeing um, maybe most of you know of a company called Athletic, which is headquartered in Connecticut, and they're located right next to Amazon's primary warehouse, and they're doing non-alc. Um, and they can, you know, your four-year-old can buy a case of beer and have it at his doorstep the next day. I think that's a, that's a category that um, I sense is gonna grow. Um, doing research on breweries, um, I picked Columbus, Ohio, just as a, a target market that, that has a lot of growth because of Ohio State and uh, its economy is doing well. And there's 60 breweries uh, in a million population. Uh, it's my thought that there's going to be a major shakeout in, in that business. Um, and, you know, ha having listened to the comment that if we made it this far, we're going to, um, you know, we're going to survive. But there's a brewery in Connecticut called Kinsman that that is um, has a brew pub, and and they're they're averaging on a Sunday thirty five thousand dollars worth of worth of sales, and they're getting into. Uh, hard seltzers and RTDs and they're building a still. And um, I think some of those people that are well-financed 
we'll make it. But uh, I sense that there's going to be a major shakeout over the next year in that business. Yeah, you know, interesting from a consumer perspective, um, my 34 year old son uh, over the past week newly discovered um, non alcohol um, cocktails, canned cocktails, and has been sharing articles, you know, like, like it's you know, like it was like he discovered it. I'm like, yeah, I know this has been happening. But, um, but he, you know, he said, oh, my, we, my friends were all, everybody loves it. We're, 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 that's, all, that's all we're drinking now, um, which I thought was an interesting observation uh, from that consumer perspective. And I, I think from my perspective, I, you know, two, three years ago, when um, I was tasting um, non-alcoholic spirits and kind of thinking that was cool and understood that, wow, the ability to buy a bottle that, you know, whether it's a non, no elk gin or a, a vermouth or a tequila. And I'm, you know, like, they don't taste that bad, but I'm kind of missing the, I'm missing the, the punch. Um, but, uh, you know, at that point, I think uh, it, what we didn't see is, is how the, ready, the RTD, um, non-alcoholic, you know, the, the mixed cocktail would really emerge out of COVID uh, as such a, a player. Um, so let's do this. Let's segue now to um, Paula. And Paula, I want to apologize. I missed your webinar from last night, but unfortunately, I discovered the Squid Game, uh, and I and I couldn't uh, I couldn't stop watching. <laughs> I had to watch the next episode. And I what I, is it called? I, I had a choice of doing the Squid Game or jumping onto this barrel. Oh, Squid Game webinar. He's yeah. addicted to Netflix. <laughs> I yeah. heard th this is what I was. I had a lunch meeting with a bunch of guys from my distributor, and that's all they were talking about yesterday. And I got to be honest, I don't even know what it is, what it means, I'm gonna watch it. And then I also saw on the news, like whatever Halloween costume is associated with it, you're not gonna be able to get it for the, your kids the, this the year. Mask. Yeah, and, and the, quote, the quote from um, uh, uh, Netflix saying that this is going to be the, this is on track to be the most viewed program we've ever had. And if you watch it at first, for the first half an hour, you're going to say, what the W? Well, he told me the first episode was called Red Light, Green Light, and then people, uh, they kill each other or something? Like, we'll I don't have know. to watch, but, you know, I'm not okay. going to do it. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Paula, so tell us um, um, what's new in your world, and I know there's always something new. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so we we did. We had our first webinar on NFTs and per using NFT platform to purchase rare bottles of spirits. And we recently had our launch about less than two weeks ago for our NFT pre-sales. And we were taking pre-sales all the way up to October 10th, which was supposed to be our hardcore release. But we have sold out of 90% of our bottles in the first two hours. So that was exciting. And um, basically everything, because we, we only had 111 bottles on the first release and Barrel Finance held back 11 bottles to be auctioned off later in the month on, on um, uh, either the, the 10th or we have some secret bottles that we're holding back for 1111. Our whole thing has been on the campaign of 11 and 111 and 111 bottles. And we launched on, on 10 ones. We've got all these 1111s in I'm a numerologist, like, so it's just important number for me. So I'm like, if I'm in the spirits business, I'm going to play with my metaphysics and everything's in the 11s. And it's so amazing that the people we're talking to keep coming in saying, we're having this at 1111 at 1111 and we, like things we didn't even plan. And other people are pointing out all the 1111s and the 11s everywhere. So it's been so much fun. But we did an introductory call just to get the people who had already signed up for pre-sales or anybody who wanted to join. And let me tell you, a lot of people really want to know. They want to understand NFTs and what the values are and, and how you leverage them and how you open a crypto wallet and how you, you know, get protected and how you have a hard wallet and a soft wallet and a heated wallet and a, and a MetaMask. And how do you get on all of these IO platforms that are out there? So I am so delighted. And what's so interesting to me is that all the metaphors that I'm giving about understanding NFTs and investments and this being the cryptocurrency really being the, the way of our future I feel like, oh my gosh, I've been saying the same thing about the alcohol industry for the last 15 years. They are so tied together that, uh, as far as compliance, regulatory work, how the valuations you know, are, are, are truly asymmetrical. Like, it's just amazing to me how the techniques and the, the concepts about educating them from financial positions 
fall hand in hand with the spirits business. So I'm delighted. I'm so excited about the opportunity of what this is doing overall as a platform. Are you talking about blockchain technology? I mean, you kind of lost me on this whole thing. I I did. So we put our distillery up on the blockchain and started releasing our products through NFT releases. So we're developing artists. We had an artist contest. If you go on my LinkedIn, you'll be able to read all the white pages of the things that we're doing along the way. But okay. now it's just raising all these platforms about creating artists and their stories. And we created a augmented reality pig. My 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 distillery is called the Stripe Pig Distillery. So now you can get this little augmented reality pig that you could plop in and play video games with and just put them like in your own settings. You could take my pig and put him in your backyard if you wanted to and show him walking around through your backyard around your porch or in your kitchen. And people are having fun just playing with the pig. It's been a lot of fun. I'm curious to get the perspective of those, those investment finance folks who are on this call in terms of the aspect of um, literally uh, raising funding um, at, by selling, um, uh, you know, blockchain uh, uh, tradable, tradable, you know, EFTs, uh, uh, and we're looking at that. Uh, and I think we've talked about this in previous uh, episodes in terms of the bourbon bond funds that we run, mm -hmm. uh, that individuals can invest in and buy a, you know, they can invest in a unit of, of equity. In a, in a fund that goes and finances the, the distillation and the aging of wholesale whiskey. And then when it's sold uh, on the, as bulk spirits, they receive the, the net profit, you know, the difference between uh, the, the wholesale cost and the cost of aging and what it sells for. But, um, and we've done that successfully, but the, it seems to us that the next uh, opportunity is to make it so that the investors are not, um, they can make the decisions on when to trade or sell their asset uh, at whatever price they can get versus waiting for the whiskey to become four years old. Um, and, uh, and I know that Sherman is listening in, he's on the road, so I don't know if he can verbalize this, but um, you know, we've done some research together on that uh, and, uh, and, and, and continue to pursue that um, uh, for that. So I don't know, is that something, um, Ross, uh, uh, that you're, playing with or seeing or? Um, sure, so on blockchain, um, you know, we've been, you know, following blockchain technology as it applies to uh, really enhancing the supply chain uh, too often. I mean, as we've seen over the last few years, security of supply has become increasingly uh, an issue in the C-suite today, whether it's in uh, beverage alcohol, or if it's in coffee and tea or other, uh, other ag resource products, there's a lot of supply risk and blockchain has made, you know, has had a big, you know, impact on providing greater transparency to the flow of raw materials and finished product through the value chain. And in, in certain categories, it's, it, it, it's done uh, a lot for sustainability. And, uh, and, you know, just adding that trust factor to, uh, to a product as it, as it migrates from source to, to uh, the consumer. Uh, so I'm a, big, I'm a big believer in it. And we're seeing blockchain technology adopted across all beverages today. Uh, and, 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 and I think it's here to stay. This is, this is, uh, providing tremendous value for transparency. It's that today. Uh, the cryptocurrency uh, that you, you talked about is, is not something I spend a lot of time on. Frankly, uh, KPMG, I, I guess not surprisingly, is a big financial service provider. Um, we're, we're not able to really focus on cryptocurrency yet. It's just not... Um, I, I don't think our, uh, our risk tolerance is there in terms of uh, being able to monitor it and being able to have transparency on uh, origination. And it's, it's probably, you know, a, a little ways off yet before you'll see, you know, 
firms like KPMG, you know, really um, dedicate resources to it. I mean, there's plenty of knowledge on the space inside our firm, but it's just not something at corporate at the corporate finance level that we're we're focused on right now. So I can't really add much comment. You know, I, I think what's going to happen is that um, we'll we'll be like at a plateau for a while, and then it'll be everywhere. I'm starting to get approached by the hedge funds now, in Connecticut, as as you mentioned, which sure. I'm from, where I'm originally from too, and they are looking for opportunities to take the crypto um, currency funds that they have created, and you know they're raising just like Michael with the bond fund, they're raising money hand over foot. And now they have to look for different exchanges, different ICOs to be able to invest in for their clients. So I, I don't see it going away. I definitely see how the applications, you know, are gonna, gonna be used. I'm tying everything together by putting all of our activity on the blockchain. And then by creating the NFT, at least I'm giving the cryptocurrency world an opportunity to spend their money and to right. get the value of a, an aging product that has at least some significance be, besides just a token piece of artwork. So I'm trying to tie all this together as an experience and create a community that that gets educated about different alternatives and ways to purchase. You can purchase with cash too, by the way, but the NFT techies, you know, they want to use their crypto and they want to have it be converted into something that gives them an, an edge, right? It's a hedge for them because in right. their worst case they're going to drink an amazing bottle of bourbon what do they care so it's it's kind of taking away some of the risk for them to leverage their 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 crypto i see that crypto has got uh, an incredible amount of volatility and i also see regulation a uh, looming towards crypto um so how that affects things uh if i were selling a, a product would I want to get paid in crypto um, and and have my have the valuation uh, of my of the payment uh, so so volatile? So that that that's my opinion on that for whatever it's worth. You do you can convert to U.S. dollars at any time. So the I think that the regulation is is once you buy crypto. But I think it, I look at it this way. Is there going to be a decentralized opportunity for the people to control the value of their, their earnings? And with the countries that are embracing and opening and accepting current cryptocurrency as automatic, I mean, I don't know if you go on your PayPal or your Venmo or Wells Fargo, they'll say, do you want to buy crypto? Do you want to exchange for crypto? Think about when we used to go on a travel plane to a foreign country and the first thing you do off the airplane is go to the exchange desk and you're exchanging, you know, your US yeah. dollars or whatever the currency is of the country. And so that's the thing is that if all the, if the, if more and more adaptation of accepting crypto as currency to use in the marketplace, especially because they're doing it all mobily, then it doesn't matter whether it's bananas or ETH or apples or hamburgers, right? This is just something you own that has a trading value. That's the value it on a particular day and you're converting it to the currency of where you're spending your money. Well, that's an interesting uh, perspe perspective on, on, on it. I mean, you know, I haven't looked at it that way. I think it's probably the most brilliant, succinct description I've heard. <laughs> yeah. So kudos to you, Paula. Um, so let's see, let's keep, uh, keep going around here. Uh, I know we want to get back to Carrie to talk about wine, but before we do that, I think we should say hello to Stephanie, um, who's listening in and, um, uh, and see what she's seeing and hearing from the world of spirits as she's, uh, in Kentucky and dealing with lots of, uh, lots of different players, uh, from a lot of different levels in marketing and sales and in sourcing. How are you today, Stephanie? I'm good. How are you? Um, it's been uh, it's been an interesting few weeks or since I was on here last uh, for the industry in terms of uh, whiskey and barrel valuation. That uh, you know, it's been trading. Whiskey's been trading um, pretty intensely. Uh, whiskey. By the time you find find out, it's that there's some whiskey on the market. It's gone. It's uh, people, again, still, you can't even, I mean, if, if I find a buyer that would like to try it first before they buy it, it's not there, uh, you know, when the samples come in. Um, so 
the Kentucky whiskey market still uh, super brisk. I uh, think, you know, like there's a lot of supply here and eventually that supply is going to start. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, fairly soon we'll start seeing supply on the market. And I think that's going to have an interesting impact on um, the pricing. I think the uh, Kentucky whiskey under two years old is undervalued right now because everybody's so heavily focused on whiskey over four years that the pricing is, um, is, is aggressive on the higher priced or the higher age whiskeys. But I think if, you, um, if you're looking around value wise that there's some, some whiskey out there that, that may be undervalued, um, uh, which is uh, kind of interesting to me. I also, uh, let's see, trend-wise for uh, whiskey in other markets, um, that's also still uh, trending as well. So the values are, are uh, holding in other markets throughout the country, which is, is a good thing. Um, similar to what uh, Sam mentioned, like if you want to talk about Kentucky distilleries and uh, market the market for um distilleries in kentucky uh it's pretty still aggressive here it's it's a, right now i'm at least for me i'm seeing that it's a seller's market um in terms of distillery sales or uh whiskey sales particularly if it's if it's out of kentucky and um that's kind of what's on my radar right now what i've been working with um, there's, I, I have uh, some interesting movement with regard to uh, clients coming into into the U.S. from other markets. Um, I know we talked touched on uh, trends with coronavirus and uh, getting product into market, and um, there's some clients I have in Australia that are uh, still in lockdown. They their supply chain is as bad as ours. It's a global issue. Their supply chain, anything coming from China into Australia is also as, um, as encumbered as it is for us. So uh, there's some, you know, the trends are consistent with what you guys have mentioned in the last, you know, 45 minutes um, globally. So I find that to be relatively interesting as well. Um, and that's just kind of a, a little snippet on what I've been working with and what I'm seeing since the last call we had. Hmm. Um, something that I'm wondering about, um, and that is Tennessee. I've had more contacts in the past month from um, producers that are looking to raise money to expand or to start up distilleries in Tennessee um, to produce contract, which is something that hasn't really been done much before. Dickel is pretty much the only Tennessee um, bunk that I see, but I'm, I'm just not, um, I'm not sure what the market is for it because I don't, I don't have anyone who's ever wanted to buy any Tennessee unless it's 15 years old. Right, and I, I as well, uh, my client list, uh, the people that I work with, I don't, um, usually regularly have that request for uh, contract Tennessee whiskey, unless it was through Dickel. Um, I do, I'm aware of some distilleries that are attempting to open up in Tennessee under the idea that they would do contract distilling. Um, I just don't really, I can't speak to that because I don't have any clients in my, in my, um, in my network that have requested specific Tennessee contracting. Yeah, I mean, I think with my um, my perspective on it is that if you're going to be doing contract distilling in Tennessee, you need to be prepared to be producing your own juice uh, and laying it down because that's what's going to sell. Uh, okay. You know, and the supply because you, you know we we had a ten barrels of fifteen year old that within fifteen minutes of listing it, I had three buyers for it. But meantime, I've got we've got you know Newfield, Tennessee, and Young, Tennessee that no, not a person has ever inquired about. Right, and and I think the pricing, you know, maybe on the on the New Bacon, Tennessee is is maybe they're comp 
compressing it with Kentucky and it may not be the right uh, you know, pricing and people may not find the value to be here for that. Yeah, I, I think there's a sense of you've got uncle nearest, uh, obviously Dickel, but you've got uncle nearest that's Tennessee and that's, you know, become such a, uh, an attention getter. Um, I, you know, uh, of course, Jack, you know, um, but I think, uh, you know, and, it, and it, it does make sense when you look at who the leaders are in the category that, you know, you've got some Tennessees in there, but just from a, from a sourcing and supply, I just don't, I don't see it. So um, I, don't know if I was missing something, but you're seeing the same thing. Can I make a comment? Sure. So there's been a lot of discussion about contract production. Um, and of course, I'm coming at it from the American single malt category. Mm -hmm. And the speculators, the bulk buyers, et cetera, are all saying, we don't really know where this is gonna go. And we don't really know what the future is gonna be, where there's a good idea of what a Kentucky bourbon is gonna be worth in a few years. And of course that's a moving target, but they know what's going up. Mm -hmm. With an American single malt, they don't. But one of, the, one of the largest speculators in the country and I were talking the other day about some things, and he actually mentioned Tennessee as well. And he said, there's a bunch of people trying to come in in Tennessee. And yes, it could be called a bourbon. It can be called a Tennessee whiskey, depending on, on what they're doing and et cetera. Um, but at the same time, there's still a big question as to whether or not, other than Dickel, it's going to have the same type of growth value. Right. So I just figured I'd add that in because it was a comment no, I think that's, I think 72 that's, hours ago. Very, you know, that's, that's really the issue. It's like, uh, look, Kentucky... I, I um, we announced uh, two weeks ago after this last call that we had 1,800 barrels of uh, one-year-old um, um, juice that we were releasing, uh, and uh, as of um, this week, it's all resold. It's either financed by bourbon bond funds or uh, it's bought. I mean, it went very quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, it didn't even it didn't even last four days. I don't think did it. I mean, no, it didn't. I mean, I, by the time I sent the email out on a Friday afternoon at three forty-five, by five thirty, I had uh, at least um, four hundred barrels committed, and then I got an email uh, about um, uh, I got an email about uh, someone saying I'll buy whatever you don't have, and that all has happened. Um, you know whatever you don't have finance. So that's happened. And we're actually closing on that um, Monday. Yeah, that's what I have a sample. You know, it's a whiskey under two years. It went quickly. That's what I'm saying. I think yeah. everybody's so focused on aging. Oh, yeah, I haven't received a sample of it yet, even to send to anybody. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, that's that's the thing that happens in the Kentucky market. They don't get any in the other market. And I know, that, I mean, we'll see. I mean, maybe Tennessee can do it. And and I, I mean, I study trends and I do analytics, you know, for a lot of my clients and malt whiskey, you know, it's, it's, I think it's going to surface in the next few years. There's a lot of people laying down malt whiskey in the last year and a half um, that I, that I know in my network. So I know, I know there's a trend coming. Um, the trend isn't here yet because that malt whiskey is aging and it's, it's working its way to where it's supposed to be to be released in market. But I do, um, I do see some trends on that. I know the TTB is, is uh, aware that that's becoming a trend because, you know, the TTB wouldn't be releasing guidelines mm -hmm. if there wasn't a trend coming. Um, so, you know, I, I do see that one uh, on the horizon uh, in the next probably two to three years, if not a little sooner, but um, it, I'll be interested to see how that one that one goes because you know uh, a, a single a malt whiskey produced here in the U.S. is going to be different than one produced in you know Scotland and in the European markets because um, I'm pretty sure the new rule is that for the U.S. market I'll have to research that whether you can age it in new or used um, barrels but. You know, the European market's been doing it a long time and they've figured out ways to age, you know, where you get a really nice smooth byproduct. So we'll see how the malt whiskey trend works here. Uh, Stephanie, yes. I, I, I would just add to your comment that I do think there is a growing market for non-Kentucky whiskey. Uh, I was 
I, I say that because earlier this week, I talked to um, the head of M&A for one of the larger uh, whiskey producers, one of the larger in the world. And when we talked about priorities, he specifically mentioned uh, non-Kentucky whiskey. Um, and he, and specifically, you know, Mark, you know, Texas, Colorado, New York. Um, I, I think it just, uh, it, it, it's, my takeaway is that, um, you know, these la large whiskey producers that have, you know, uh, a strong portfolio of Kentucky bourbon, uh, they're looking for diversification. They're looking to, you know, for new market opportunities. Um, and let's face it, I mean, you, you don't want to be that big producer that misses out on the next whistle pig or, you know, another such uh, brand opportunity. So, well, but I, I, how, how much of that is driven on the fact that it's trying to, because if we're talking about merger acquisitions and Kentucky's a premium market, it's premium pricing. So, it's how much of that is the willingness or ability to pay premium for being in Kentucky and real in deciding that they don't want to pay the premium and they're going to look at other markets. Yeah, great. Question. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess. They started out wanting to be in Kentucky, and they're exploring other markets because they don't want to pay. Well, I think it 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 may have a little bit to do with that. I I I wouldn't disagree, but I also think it's about you know tapping into that a market opportunity where there's a local hero that, you know, has the brand equity and can open up new markets, uh, perhaps new channels that they're not otherwise uh, strong in. So I think it's, I think it's recognition that there, that the craft spirit industry, there, there are a number of those local heroes who have done very, very well. And, you know, there's room, it, even of the, in the biggest portfolios, there's room for those. And surprisingly, I said, I kind of tested them on, well, how small is too small? And, and you know what his answer was is nothing's too small. I mean, the big guys are hungry for growth. They don't want to miss uh, an opportunity for some real growth. Uh, and, and are willing to get in at an earlier stage than really ever before. So I, I think it's a good, uh, I, you know, I, I, th I just think it's good to be mindful of that uh, when you think about Kentucky bourbon versus, you know, these other four or five states that, that, that we're starting to see some real, um, you know, they're, 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 they're popping up now on a more on a more national scene and scale, and it, it's good to it's good to have an eye out for them as well. Oh yeah, I mean I absolutely agree. Like on a merger acquisition setting, and get you know like we're talking, I'm not sure what the, whether they're doing you know contract distillation and if there's you know what their value is in that. Um, that's maybe two. No, I think I, I think in these cases it's really not about contract opportunities this is about um you know brand equity yeah you know, on a regional basis and yeah. i agree with that and that takes you know like somebody that i mean a lot of the just these places um the people that are doing it right you know have got the right business mix they've got the right mix of marketing they've you know figured out how to do the distillery how to do their you know brands the right way without um you know, losing money so that they don't run themselves out of business, basically. Right, right. It's, it's, uh, they have some success and some track record for a company to want to, to look at them a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Well, I have, uh, I want to ask you about something that I think relates both to an investment, um, forecast as well as to the supply. And that I've recently, um, been meeting with a group that is a very large uh, investment group. They invest hundreds of millions of dollars in the numbers of categories. Uh, and Spirits is one of them. They claim it's their smallest category. Um, what their business model has been is that they will um, pre-purchase 
20,000 barrel a year allocations from producers and pay them 100% of whatever the negotiated price is. And it's usually a, a low price, but it's still a worthwhile price. And they will pay them 100% upfront. So it's how a lot, some of the um, distillers are getting the capital um, to operate and grow. But they have found that they can't, um, they, they have allocations now that go through uh, part of 2022, but they, they're having trouble getting allocations, even you know, with that off, trouble getting allocations for 23, 24, and they usually operate two years out. And they've done this for a number of years, uh, which is an interesting, I guess the only conclusion is that this almost relates back to what Sam is saying that you know, people think the value, it's, their, their value is greater than that. Why should I take money at, you know, why should I, uh, even if it's $10 million, uh, you know, for 20,000 barrels at $500 a piece that they can then, they, you know, rather than getting that money, they're better off, um, you know, selling that as new fill for eight or $900 a barrel. Uh, but that's, uh, that was an interesting dynamic and they're not the only ones. There's another group who in these all groups want to remain confidential. You, have, you can't even have a conversation with an NDA. But there's another group that you know we've um, we've purchased. Uh, you know uh, uh, we didn't know who the who the seller was until the end. And it was you know a fund, um, and uh, it kind of bit me in the behind because they apparently are unbeknownst to me on our email list and saw the prices that we were selling it for. And so by the time you know, we were closing the deal. They raised the price, you know, and and uh, and and then they said we're not selling anymore till next year. <laughs> Sounds like that because they were. Well, you know, saying there was what I understand. Selling. What I understand in Kentucky is that I mean, there's no capacity, so sure. Kentucky, Kentucky naturally would bring a premium. Tennessee, if you have Dickel and you have you know others that that have built out and and have capacity, um, well, that's a market. Um, on the other hand, Mark Brown did an article, what was it, Ross, uh, day before yesterday? You might want to talk to that mm -hmm. about Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if anybody wants to know, this group that has, uh, still has 20,000 uh, 20, uh, barrels of allocation, um, you know, uh, is selling it you know, has given it to us to list to sell um, for, for a new allocation, um, but the price is much higher than it was six months ago. Uh, you, know, so. you know, I just moved $3 million worth of bourbon from my Kentucky distillery to South Carolina for a couple <clears throat> of reasons. One, the property taxes. So every time I have to age right in Kentucky, I'm paying more property taxes on on those own goods and I'm paying them year after year after year. Two, I said, you know, think about the hero I can be right now to move. I have another 2 million sitting there, but I moved over the first three. But to move that in a transfer and bond transaction to North Charleston, which is an opportunity zone underserved neighborhood and generate 10% of that in sales tax for a community who is suffering. I can literally shift my liquid assets around and empower communities to do better. So I'm, I'm looking at how do I create economic impact in the locations where I move my bourbon? Mm. I'm, you know what I'm saying? I'm starting to think of that, about this from a different picture now that, you know, to those who are- Rather than what is Kentucky saying, collecting the ad valorem tax, um, you, you pay it and you sell it out of, out of South Carolina and you're paying the receiving sales tax is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah, so Question, saying, why, do you, why do you think Charleston is suffering? I was oh, there a lot, I just spent a week there. Well, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. There's lots I mean, of economic discovery. I mean, I'm sorry, there's, you know, there's economic depreciation communities in every state. So I'm just saying the fact that I'm a Charleston, what is the saying? 
to those who are given many gifts becomes great responsibility, right? So in my old age, I'm starting to think I'm also an ordained minister. So the, the pun about the fact that I'm working heavily in the spirits business, I don't take lightly. The irony for me is, oh, what, how can I be a steward of good spirits here? And so, but it came, it occurred to me that by moving these products and selling out of different states, I'm really creating an opportunity. I mean, there's just so many things to think about besides just the location. So are you saying, are you saying distilled in Kentucky and aged in South Carolina? Is that how sometimes we do? That? Sometimes we don't. Lots of distiller source products. And to Ross's point, they, the, for the people that are less concerned about it, is it a Kentucky product? It's got to be aged a year and a day to have, to be able to put Kentucky on the label. Right. But I have people that don't want Kentucky on the label. I'm not right. going to fight. I'm not going to fight with them. They're like, look, we want really good products. We don't care whether they say Kentucky or not. So it just depends. There's the marketplace that absolutely wants Kentucky. And there's another marketplace that's less concerned. I think the consumer marketplace is less focused on Kentucky. The producer you know, buying sourced is very focused on Kentucky. That's, I think, what the what, what I think is happening. Um, this has been terrific, Wendy. Um, uh, I want to say hello to Wendy before we move on because she hasn't. Um, uh, she's gone away, maybe. Um, Wendy is uh, uh, owns a small craft uh, distillery in Arizona. And Wendy, what 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 are you taking away from this conversation? Um, that's that you can apply. Um, beyond my normal uh, reevaluation of my strategic plan, I think I have to reevaluate it even more. Um, enlightening um, for the how far out we need to really um, start to think about purchasing for our glassware. Really concerned about that. We're already struggling. We put in our uh, order for the entire year back in March, and we still haven't gotten our order from. August and we were yet to get a second order of bottles in um, this month. So I don't, I don't see it happening. Um, well, you better, you better reach out to Attila after this uh, to get on his list. He's already on my list. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then everybody talking about Kentucky um, whiskey. We do source our whiskey. Um, we also do private labeling. So um, Kentucky hasn't been a big concern for the private label people that we work with. So we're buying Tennessee whiskey and then we're blending it with um, other whiskey. So, so far the consumers like it. So we're gonna go with it and run with it. So, and then we're launching direct to consumer in two more weeks. So that's just been delayed, just difficulty working with, uh, I guess, just other contractors to get all the work done for it. Are so. Um, what, what platform are you doing for direct? We're going to work with Speakeasy. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, I think they've been the easiest to work with, at least on our end, but, um, you know, we're invested at this point. So we just want to get out there and get it going and um, start doing the promotion for it. I need to get it out now. So. All right. Well, that's, um, so, you know, uh, again, I'll bring my consumer perspective. Last night, I realized that, um, I had finished my, my daily drinker bourbon. And so I went on Drizzly and I, not that I couldn't drive two miles to the store, but it was raining. And so I, I ordered a bottle and showed up in 15 minutes. And I was like, oh, that's pretty good. Anyway. Yeah, um, Drizzly seems to be very, very good in the delivery. Yeah, and now they what, did they get um, um, merged with uh, DoorDash? Yeah. So, and then isn't DoorDash being bought by, I mean, it's like, yeah, so um, they're in the right place. It's going to be Amazon soon. Um, Amazon, you know, immediate. Um, all right, before we go on to talk about wine up, uh, Braxton, I know has been patient. Um, Braxton, um, you know, it just any, any, any takeaways or any insights from the world of uh, printing that you want to share? I just feel sorry for all you guys that are dealing with all those issues that everybody's discussed. I, I, I feel your pain. I really do. Um, <clears throat> I kind of feel, I mean, I'm, I, I just, I hear it and I, it's frustrating for you guys and I, I wish things would be different. Um, once you get past all that stuff, I can help you with the, the fun things. So when you're getting your products out to market and you need little bottle neckers and tags, uh, or you need to purchase signage to help promote your products. That's where Boost comes in. I think, I think these are some that you sent me. Yes, sir. I sent you those. And so <clears throat> whether you uh, 
working directly yourself or through a distributor, we can send stuff to you, distributors, reps. Uh, we have a great kitting and fulfillment department for posters, banners, all that kind of stuff. So um, I hope everybody works through their issues and gets to the point where they're selling some stuff and if you need some help getting the consumer attraction and telling your story, let me know and I can help out. I'll definitely right. reach out to you, Braxton, because we use stuff like that all the time. Yes. Yep. We'll have her. Where, where, are you, where are you based out of? We're based in Tulsa. Okay. So we, we've been a supplier for companies like Brand Muscle. Um, so basically, I mean, I, I have to use Brand Muscle when I go through Southern, but I have the ability to produce stuff on my own, which is preferable. Yeah. We're a factory direct source. So we'll offer really fast lead times, competitive pricing. We're a digital printing company. So it doesn't have to be large runs. We can do small runs. Okay. Uh, for promotional events, uh, all different kinds of things. So. Excellent. Um, all right, so Carrie, um, let's talk about um, you know your your what has led to this wine up uh, discussion. Well, um, I actually find it fascinating um, to listen to all of the challenges, if you want to put it, and 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 the back end of the business because I'm obviously not in the um, production as most of the people on this call are. Um, I, I did start in spirits. I worked for Bacardi for six years and I have moved on to the wine side in the last 20. Um, but so I, I guess it was maybe after, I don't know if it was the last caller of the call before I said, Hey, did you, I, I don't know. I think I emailed Stephanie. Did you guys ever think about doing this with a wine group? Cause I tend to be, except for the other two people I invited, which one girl didn't even come on the call today. Um, the only wine person, um, but I assume you guys drink wine. You can't just drink your bourbons and whiskeys and tequila like all the time. Definitely get bourbon fatigue and have to have a good <laughs> glass of wine. I mean, and I can't drink wine all the time either. So I, I, I think it's like, I think it's a good mix, but um, Michael did suggest maybe we had a, a breakout session, but I don't know what we're going to break out with if I'm the only one that's going to sit here and talk about <laughs> no, wine. I think what we, what sure. we want to do is kind of get the discussion going so those of us who also know other people in wine and that we basically will you know invite more wine people to this but we will then do a breakout you know so this because i think if it yeah point, if it evolves into that i mean yeah, well, let's see help. what we get right and i think what you know what i want to try to see if we can you're what you're talking about is that you get some value out of the general discussion i absolutely get value out of it really so, you know that i mean i think we're all in the same boat whether we're talking about bourbons or whiskeys, we've, we've all got a glass problem. We've all got a dry goods problem. We've all got drayage issues. We've all got truck driver issues. I mean, there, you know, it, we've all got issues. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's issues in the market. I mean, I, I, like I was telling Paula, like I spent last week in South Carolina, the week before I was in New York, and I'm sure you've all seen like the on-premise business in New York city right now is a disaster. You have to show a vax card and it's all um whether you walk in the door and the hostess asks you before you're seated that's one issue but then there's a lot of places where they they don't even have enough people i mean we're all on the same boat with this there's not even enough employees to work in the on-premise realm right now so you could be sitting there for 10 minutes and then your server comes up and you, you've already looked at the menu and you're ready to order and then they want to see your card and if you don't have the card you got to go but meanwhile you've already been in there. And, and if they're worried about people to be infected, I mean, it's all, it's just crazy. It really like it, it's, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess we should all be thankful that we are in the alcohol industry business there industry. Because, exactly. All right. Because so there's Harry's, a lot of uh, stuff Harry's happening. Stephanie and I will be chatting more about this in person on Monday. But if can I do? Can I ask one question? Because we all are drinkers. Um, well, I'm assuming on this call. Um, has anyone heard of orange wine? Or what? Orange wine. Okay. Uh, meaning to be used as a base in spirits, or no? As it is literally. It's from? like it's in between a white and a rosé. I mean, it's a wine that's produced with the skins left on a little bit longer, but my, we are producing one. We started, I mean, we're doing it for Canada, but I am going to launch it in New York. But it's just interesting that a lot of people that I've talked to 
Well, first of all, it's not made out of oranges. It is made out of grapes. That's what I was going to ask. Is it orange peel? No, it's made out of grapes. The skins are fermented along. I mean, it, it, it's a, I just wanted to. I just wanted to see because you guys are all professionals. Who had heard of it? Who has not? Because a lot of people in New York City, uh, Brooklyn, some Connecticut people are, are really asking for it. National uh, Orange Wine Day was two days ago. It was on the Today Show. It was on several uh, talk shows, but. Um, I just need to find out if it's worth the investment of trying to launch it in the U.S. market in my territories. But a lot of people just just be careful. Idea. Canadian markets and U.S. markets have completely different taste profiles. Um, no, I've, I know. I, I know. I've had I've had lots of orange wines. I enjoy them, but it's a very very different palette up here versus down there. So I yeah. wouldn't even use us. Like I, for me to get a bourbon up here in Quebec is a night. Nice nightmare I'm it, it's I have to scour everywhere and everything's sold back you know back order all the time I have to drive over to Ontario to pick up bourbons because I can't find them here in Quebec don't use Canada as as a springboard for flavor profiling in the U.S. I wasn't using totally it as a profile different. I was just saying that we're making 50,000 cases for Canada and I was given the opportunity to take some of that lot for the United States and really the only people that seem to be asking for it is New York City yeah, so I, would go, I, would, I, I would go. I would go East Coast on it. Yeah, North Carrie, East. I, I'm not, I don't. I'm I not only made the with... East Coast. So. I'm sorry. I was just Carrie. It's it's Ross. I was just uh -huh. going to say I, I I'm I've not heard of it, but you've really piqued my curiosity. Now I'm going to look it. for it. It, it, yeah. it sounds intriguing. Obviously, obviously that category that that you know what you're straddling are two two very interesting large categories right so between it's white supposed and to be the big it's the big buzz right now apparently okay. I mean, there's there's a few companies that do it most of them are french I, I think i said earlier i work for an italian company so this will be coming from pavia but you know if if you like rosés i mean it, it's the same kind of principle right well, it's oh, distributed. But we'll see what i'll probably see it everywhere now that you um, yeah <laughs> probably see it everywhere you heard it here first yeah <laughs> I was thinking it had CBD in it. No, no. <laughs> well, that's a whole nother, that's a whole yeah, exactly. nother category that's about to go nuts. Exactly. Well, we're not we getting have, involved in that. We have uh, wasted another good 90 minutes, almost, no, that we haven't wasted. <laughs> uh, and we had talked about ending this with doing some testimonials, although I think some of the regulars have dropped off. Uh, but I'm going to uh, give anyone a chance to um, answer the question um, uh, very simply. Um, and I'm going to start with Carrie. Carrie, what keeps you coming back? Sorry, I had muted myself because I what, thought I was what, done. What <laughs> keeps you coming back to drinks professionals gatherings? Again, like, I mean, I, I, I find it fascinating because I've been on both ends, but most of you guys on this call are on the other end of it, which, you know, I'm more... Uh, in the trade in the field i'm managing distributors i'm managing the containers coming over where you guys are like in production and sourcing the glass and all that i mean i'm aware of the glass problems and the dry good problems but that this is not going to sound it's not going to come out right but i'm going to say that's not my problem i mean it is my problem at the you know in the long run but that is not my problem to deal with so i see what all you guys are like struggling with and so i know what my people in Italy are dealing with and you know I feel it on the other end I mean we we don't have goods to get here we're going to miss out on holiday gift packs we're you know we don't have the cardboard to make these Prosecco you know gift boxes that that are supposed to be here like in two weeks I mean I, I'm hoping we even get them here for Thanksgiving but it's all these issues that makes me appreciate more what the people in my company are doing over there to hear your side of it, if that makes any kind of sense. All right, thank you. And Paula, let's go to you next. Paula, what keeps you coming back to drinks professionally? Well, first of all, I love it that it's on a Friday because for me, it's like it gets me into the mood and it breaks up my day. And I, I look I actually look forward to it because it's like, okay, it's 1130. Huh, I could sleep until 1115 and then be ready for drinks. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> seriously though, Friday's like a hard day. And I, <laughs> and I feel like, for those of you who know, you, you may carry, you said like everybody drinks, like I'm not a big drinker. I, I do not, I hardly, Michael can tell you this. Like I am not, I'm like a one drink person. It takes me an hour to drink it. 
<laughs> but that makes me a really good taster for the business, right? And and I do. I drink for a living. So um, it's just so great to meet everybody. I always pick up on something. I think for all of us as human beings, when you get confirmation about something that you're on or there's contrast for a way that your brain is thinking, it's helpful to help you solidify and sort out the things in your own head. And I think that's what I get out of this. And then, of course, I get to see my friend Stephanie and Michael and all you guys that I don't know so well yet. Like, I look forward to meeting you all so that we're, we're at events. You know, I feel like there's there's kinship and relationships. So I appreciate it all. Great information. Great people. Sam Brown, what keeps you coming back? You know, I learn something every time. I, this is the second call I've been on. And the this crowd is very dynamic and diverse and I, I just keep picking up bits of information. I complain to Stephanie Shirk all the time that, uh, you know, things aren't happening fast enough for me. Uh, and it's comforting to, to know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. And um, it's a, uh, it's just a great group of people. I, I, I can't express myself more sincerely than that. I truly enjoy it. And I, I look forward to, to the next event. Uh, it's kind of lonely being an entrepreneur as everyone knows. And so therefore um, I feel like I've made new friends, new acquaintances, and it's always good to learn something else and something new. And Sam, I want to say your perspective is invaluable on these calls you've been on. So I appreciate you coming and I look forward to seeing you hopefully in person next week. We're going to talk about that. Yep. Stephanie, um, sure. What keeps you coming back? Um, I, I, there's several people on here that I know um, through the industry or, or client relationships. And for me, it's nice to connect in a uh, non-client way. Um, for just, you know, having discussion and connections and, you know, making new contacts here, you know, like there's several of you that are like I'm seeing now on a fairly regular basis through this call that, you know, I wouldn't have interacted with before. So the networking is, is good. Thank you. And Wendy. There are too many things that I get and why I keep coming back. I mean, the information, hearing where everyone is, um, for us, it's the thinking forward, probably bigger than we would have otherwise, more quickly than we would have otherwise, and reconsidering a whole lot of things that we thought were a good path and maybe not a good path. So I hope that I'm able to make at least a tiny contribution in our small way to the group. But I get a lot from um, every time I'm on the call, the direction, the industry, globally, nationally, regionally. Okay. So I, I'm honored to participate. Thank you. I think Ross has had to leave, but he, this is his first time. But uh, and until this, you were supposed to be on an earlier one, but you didn't. So now that you did jump in, worth it? I'm sorry, absolutely. Um, it's Look, I love to listen to this because... I'm the Canadian perspective wearing a maple leaf on my head. And um, it's interesting to see how different the dynamics are. We have 12 controlled states um, up here. Um, so it's very different, the dynamics. And when I talk to the distillers here and how they work and how they distribute their product and what the forward thinking is, um, it's exciting to see that contrast. What really, really gets me going is how forward thinking these discussions are compared to the ones that you have and I'll say on the ground floor with a lot of people where you're not always brought into the mix of the entrepreneurial spirit of how uh, of this business so we always try to you know myself and 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 the owner of the company we always try to gear ourselves to understand what the industry is where the industry is going and having discussions like this allows us to cater our thinking philosophy and even supply towards how do we help you um some of the biggest things that i've noticed is is some people want to develop a product but they they get to the product before they know how they're going to make it so how do we act as as a buffer to help 
every individual that we're working with, I don't call them customers, I call them partners. So how do we help our partners achieve success quickly, methodically, and efficiently? And, and having conversations like this, knowing where things are going and understanding everything else, it's, it's, it's a wonderful basket of knowledge for me to, to, to rest on when I go forward. I, I look forward. I look forward to the next discussion. I really do. And that would be in November. Uh, yes, Braxton, yes. Uh, finally, Braxton, we'll give you a, a moment to to close it out. I just find it interesting to listen to the <clears throat> the background of this, the industry, and as a salesperson, <clears throat> I just like to uh, get to see people and get to know people as we are virtually here, and you know, form these relationships. And as a salesperson, I hope to. You know, be a resource and uh, just be, you know, uh, a part of the group that adds some value for you and, and the group. All right. Well, thank you all again very much. Uh, the next session, as far as I know, will still be on the first Friday of November. Right, Stephanie? I, I don't think either of us have conflicts or anything. I apologize. Yep. This last week I had a conflict because I went camping. All right. So uh, <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to have any connectivity. Um, all right. Thank you all. And uh, I will. Um, um, uh, be, uh, we'll be, Steph Stephanie will do the follow-up email. Uh, just a final note, we are still trying to figure out um, ongoing um, uh, contributions of support for this. Uh, so if anyone um, wants to bring it to their uh, higher ups, uh, we can talk about that. And, uh, and that's simply just to know that, you know, Stephanie is here, courtesy of Real Professionals Network. They're organizing and producing this uh, for us. Um, their background is commercial real estate where they do, she runs these programs for how many groups a month? Gosh, too many. <laughs> <laughs> about 30 a month. So 30 this a month. Has been, uh, it's been fascinating for me to learn more about this business. I am a consumer solely, but thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. All right. Thank you all. Have a great Friday and a great weekend. And great uh, weekend. Up. thanks everyone. Bye everyone. Thank you, everybody. See ya.